Axonius Federal Systems gives federal agencies the confidence to control complexity by mitigating threats, navigating risk, automating response times, and complying with federal cybersecurity guidelines. AFS is the only federal solution available that integrates with hundreds of sources to provide asset observability. Hello from Omaha. Uh, my name is Ross John Fortuny. I'm re recording from DOTUS 2024, where leaders are examining the future of integrated defense through IT superiority. Joining me now is Major General John H. Phillips, Director, Cyber and C4 at United States European Command. Welcome. Thanks, Ross. Given the increasing uh, sophistication of cyber threats, how is European Command adapting to counter these challenges, particularly you know, at a time when there's a lot of geopolitical tension? So if I go back to my younger days, NATO is only 16 countries, uh, and now it's a very large 32 countries, um, uh, and a wide range uh, of, of capabilities, uh, commitment, um, and uh, capability that those countries bring. Uh, so most people don't realize the majority of my directorate uh, is focused on interoperability uh, with our partners and allies. Not only our NATO states, um, but potential future NATO countries or collaborative partners inside integrated European uh, security. And so the majority of what my team does is interoperability uh, and partner engagement. And so I have, I have teams that are traveling all over. We just concluded what we call a command and control integration board um, uh, with a fairly new member of NATO. And we look at those gaps that those countries have, both engagement with the United States and then eventually with NATO as a whole. Spending a lot of time developing their capability sets, how we can learn from them, and more importantly, to put them on a glide path for future capability. So to that end, how do you get people in to uh, European command and train them and keep them around? I mean, this stuff is really changing a lot. So it is, it is constantly today. training. And so we don't have our own uh, independent training system. We really rely upon the training systems that Cyber Command has established uh, and the training sets that they have. The hard part isn't getting them to Europe. Of, of all the different COCOMs out there, it's probably one of the more desirable locations to be in. Um, uh, no offense to some other combatant commands. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty pleasant place to be. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, the one alliance the United States has had over 75 years uh, with NATO, um, but the challenges of NATO integration uh, is, is way different than it was in the late 1940s. Uh, getting them in is not the problem. Retaining them once we have trained them is inherently the problem. And we're seeing this with our partners and allies as well. Uh, constant evaluation. Once, once you've trained someone to be capable, you end up losing them to industry because of the huge salaries uh, that they that they are enticed by that the Department of Defense and our uh, fellow uh, countries uh, just can can't compete with. So we have to show them why it's important to do this, uh, and how we retain them is we look at a total force approach. If you can't retain them on active duty because of the lure of large salaries. Uh, how do we keep them in our reserve component where we can still engage and leverage the capabilities that they bring to the fight long term? And the intent is to focus on purpose and mission, and that retains people. You've talked a lot about NATO allies and international partners. How does that collaboration work? You mentioned it's very different now than it was in mid-century. What's the big difference? What does it look like now? And what does it look like going forward? Going forward, it, it, it's all about information exchange. Uh, I tell everybody, we can make the network, we can make the IT systems cause countries to be interoperable, but the information they provide and then need to consume really is the base layer, data. And so how do you focus on data, the security of the data, the exchange of the data that's shareable? So many countries want individual bilats or trilats with the United States and the United Kingdom. 
Um, but how do we get them to share information to NATO as a whole? Because pre-Article 5, or even in conflict and competition, how we get information to all partners and nations in a joint fires environment uh, that everybody can both share and compete uh, at a common information base layer. How do you make that data interoperable? I know that's, that's, that's the critical million dollar question, but you know, that's a moving target, is it not? It is a moving target, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, so right now, uh, two of our components really have advanced the ball in what we call mission partner environment. Uh, and it is, I'll redefine that as federated mission networking, uh, absent of cross-domain solutions. So everybody shares and collaborates at the same information domain and tetragraph, which is a fancy word for releaseability. Um, and right now, uh, our, our most capable component, U.S. Army Europe, uh, and they've been doing this for four years. They operate on a daily basis uh, on NATO secret. They do their morning update every day at that shared information domain and have 17 different NATO partners directly collaborating uh, at real time. So we can conduct and we have conducted what I call CJAD C2 now inside uh, a, a NATO environment at a releaseability that's at NATO secret. So you can have an observer in Latvia uh, identify a target, uh, relay it to a fire direction center owned by the United States, and then that gets real, relayed real time to a Polish uh, artillery battery and they can engage the target all without loss of information through a cross-domain solution, real-time, collaborative, joint fires. How do you keep that all safe when you have adversaries sort of on the doorstep, cyber adversaries on the doorstep? How do you swat, swat the bad guys so, away, so, essentially? So trust is hard. Uh, and right now, it is perimeter security uh, through traditional defensive measures. Uh, as we migrate to a NATO secret cloud, uh, where you have identity credentialing, that's going to be the hard part, uh, where some countries have the fiscal wherewithal to be able to make that investment, and some other partner nations in NATO, uh, based on defense spending, isn't quite there yet. I just wrote a story about budgets and AI, so you get, I know I'm, this is a little bit of a curveball, but how is AI working within that, and how are you working within that budget? Because I know compute is really hard to find. So AI we're still testing with. Um, there's a lot of ethical dilemmas uh, involved with AI. Uh, we stand by the fact that humans still need to be the determining factor when it comes to decisions based on AI. But is as we advance fully into the information um, um, domain and uh, information age, uh, where gold was the common currency, now data is the common currency. Uh, and it's extremely valuable. And, and protecting it is hard. Um, obviously, on a secret network, you tend not to be, uh, it's an isolation or isolated network, and so there's a little easier to secure. But anytime you share uh, directly with partner allies, you have to check with them. Um, and we do a very good job at the cybercom level of sending teams out to do defend forward operations on uh, otherwise formerly known as hunt forward operations. And, and so now defend forward is, is a little better pleasant term going forward to find adversaries on their network, find where they can improve mitigation and techniques and improve security. I want to pull on that thread a little bit because I've seen uh, General Hawk talk about um, previously known as Hunt Forward. Um, how, how do you collaborate with Cyber Command on those things, and how is that um, moving forward again with, with, with the NATO partners? So if I look at the 32 countries that we have, and then four or five other partner nations that aren't NATO members, but we have information exchange uh, agreements with them, um, we, we have a tiering of capabilities. Um, so shortly after I got here, a little over a year ago, uh, we advanced through a CCIB um, and our, our cyber partner and roadmap to develop countries going forward, and Poland had advanced to such a stage, we turned them over. So at the first layer, uh, it's a J6 to J6 
uh, at each of those countries to develop a roadmap for talent retention, recruitment, um, and a game plan going forward to establish cybersecurity. Once they get to a certain level, we turn them over to our J3. And now they are engaged in parallel operations engagements. Uh, and then the ultimate goal is the J3 then turns them over to Cybercom where they become a partner country with Cybercom. Pick a small country, let's say Malta. I'll, I'll use them as an example because they're not a NATO member. They immediately want to have an engagement and they want to be a partner with Cybercom at, at the onset. But we have to get them ready for that engagement. And so they go through those three phases of training. Uh, and when they're capable, we turn them over to Cybercom. And we have four countries right now in NATO that have direct engagements on our and are fully engaged with Cybercom on training and collaboration uh, at a strategic capability. Can you talk about what that the benefits of that, I guess. It reduces the demand on the United States, and that's what's NATO so great. So if I go back to when I was a captain and it was only 16 countries in NATO, um, there were two corps and four divisions of the United States military from an Army perspective in Europe. We only have two forward permanent brigades now. And so the more capable you can make NATO, the less reliant is needed on permanently forward stationed troops in Europe by the United States. So um, if you forgive the biblical analogy, we can, we can give them fish or we can teach them to fish. And teaching them to fish is going to inherently improve collective defense on the continent of Europe, which improves the capabilities and, and security of the United States as a whole. Yeah, and I imagine worldwide as yes. well. Thanks for listening. This podcast was a production of GovCIO Media and Research. If you like what you heard, please leave a five-star rating and review on the podcast platform of your choice. And don't forget to tell a friend or colleague. To explore the rest of our content, visit our website, govciomedia.com. Do you have a topic you want us to discuss? Contact us at newsletter at govcio.com. I'm Ross John Fortuné.